Reteach, a podcast for teachers seeking fresh viewpoints, deeper subject knowledge, and diverse thinking. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this inaugural Reteach podcast. My name is Carmel Bones, and I'm interested in all things education and have been for the last 30 years. I'm absolutely delighted this morning to have Eleanor, or that is Ellie Woodacre, a reader in Renaissance history at the University of Winchester. She specialises in queenship and royal studies and has published extensively in this area. She's editor-in-chief of the Royal Studies Journal, the series editor for several book series, the organiser of the Kings and Queen Conference and serves as a founder of the Royal Studies Network. You're very welcome to the Reteach podcast, Ellie. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation to take part. Now, I know that, Ellie, you are no stranger to Reteach and you've contributed to no fewer than seven lists already on the Reteach teacher's site, looking at Plantagenet queens, royal women of the Mughal Empire, Eastern Asia, me- medieval Islamic world, women of and the Wars of the Roses, Byzantine empresses and royal women, crusader queens of Jerusalem, the list goes on. I think our listeners can um, perhaps search Woodacre and draw up all of the content and recommendations that you have made. I suppose you've been called upon quite recently to perhaps provide some commentary and analysis on, am I right in saying, the passing of the world's longest serving queen, Queen Elizabeth II? Absolutely. It was a a really interesting kind of milestone in royal history that we've all had the opportunity to kind of witness and take part in. So yes, Queen Elizabeth is the longest serving regnant queen and one of the longest serving monarchs in history, full stop. Of course, here in the UK, she is our longest reigning monarch, male or female. So it was a particularly significant milestone to see her passing and the transition of the reign, the transition between a regnant queen and a king. Again, saying God save the king has been uh, a new thing after saying God save the queen for so long in the UK. Absolutely. And to our listeners and students, things like the changings of the coins and the stamps, that's going to be something very different for us all to get used to. But before the death of the Queen, I'm absolutely astounded to, to and delighted to say that you'd completed a comparative global study of queens and queenship. I mean, I thought, how ambitious a project is this? But it's in a wonderfully manageable 125 pages. So very accessible and digestible for teachers to take a look at. What motivated you to write this? One of the things that was really interesting to me is that we have really looked at queenship and monarchy in the context of Europe, in pre-modern Europe, particularly medieval and early modern Europe. And so we've gotten to know how it works in this particular framework really, really well. But One of the things that really almost kind of blew my mind when I started to think about queenship and how it works on a kind of global kind of timeless sense is we've been studying the anomaly. So we've got a really good understanding of how it works in this one framework. But when you think across time and space, that's actually the oddity that actually queenship and monarchy normally works in a polygamous framework. And again, not necessarily in a Christian one as well. So it was really important for me to kind of get beyond this kind of comfort zone, this area where we had been studying it really intently and start to really get the bigger picture to kind of understand what the the constants were, what the differences were when we thought, you know, it took the big picture, look at queenship. And that's fascinating because you mentioned though that we've been studying the anomaly, but the anomaly would be what's proximal to our students and teachers in Britain particularly, they've experienced then the Platinum Jubilee and the significant events of the transition to King Charles III. So their understanding of queenship will come from this monogamous European Christian experience. Can you perhaps explain a little about the pu- peculiarities of the polygamous court? Absolutely. So one of the things that really struck me when I started looking at the difference between the monogamous and the polygamous kind of court framework is it really changes kind of who is the first woman of the land and who is the most kind of significant female in the kind of monarchical framework. And the big shift is really it goes from being the king's wife to the king's mother, because in a monogamous framework, the the situation that we're all so much more familiar with 
it's the king's wife who's the first lady of the land. And there can only be one because with monogamy, the king only has one wife. And it is that woman who has this responsibility for carrying on dynastic production, if you like. So she is the bearer of legitimate heirs. She's the one that continues the line. But when you flip it over and you look at this polygamous scenario, the actual, the singular person is the king's mother, because the king may have many wives and consorts and concubines, all of whom could potentially produce heirs to the throne, but he can only have one mother, at least one biological mother. And so, you know, that that means that that woman has a singular role, and she is often the most powerful woman when you think about Asia, Africa, lots of other kind of scenarios where you have polygamous court frameworks. It's often the Empress Dowager or the Queen Mother who is the most powerful woman at court. So that's something that our students will find pretty astounding because the Queen Mother died before many of them were at school at the moment. So they don't really see a role for a Queen Mother at the moment in this scenario. So I suppose, as you say, the, the Queen's husband, and we think of the Duke of Edinburgh in this case, the Queen famously said that he was her strength and her stay. They had such a harmonious relationship. And you mentioned in your book the importance of co-ruling and various routes to power, a balance of power even when an unmarried monarch needed a consort of some kind. So students may well have come across Elizabeth I relying on William Cecil, for instance, or Catherine II when Peter died relying on Potemkin. Are there any successful and unsuccessful successful examples of pairings across time? Absolutely. So monarchy is all about power sharing. We tend to think of, you know, we think about reigns as being the reign of one person. And we, we put like one person's name on the tin, be it Elizabeth II or now Charles III. But really, one person can't do all of the ruling on their own. It's just not possible for one individual, particularly when you've got a large realm or perhaps a global empire to rule. So you have to have what Teresa Ehrenfeit called this flexible sack of monarchy. And the monarch has to kind of co-opt other people to help them with that rulership. And often it is their spouse or their partner. It could also be their mother. It could also be their brother. It could be other siblings, other members of the dynasty. It could be favorites. It could be the mistress. It could be you know, other ministers of state, etc. But you have to kind of share rule. And the dynamic, the amount you share and what you share varies. And it's getting that balance right. So when you think about kind of a, particularly a spouse and a monarch, it doesn't have to necessarily be 50-50 for it to work well. But what's most important is that both partners are happy with how power is shared and happy with that balance. Even if it's 90-10, it could be even 90-10 in favor of the woman, like Maria Carolina of Naples, who were kind of, it was kind of running the show because her husband was more than happy kind of getting on with hunting and doing the things that he liked to do. He was more than happy. He said, you take it away. I'm, I'm very happy for you to go and kind of run the show. So it just matters that both partners are happy with it. So. Elizabeth II and the Duke of Edinburgh is a great example where they had an, a very effective partnership, both personally and politically. They made that situation work really well. And it took time for both of them to adjust to the role initially, but they developed this power sharing dynamic, which really worked well over you know over, over 70 years almost of, of kind of co-rule. But when you think about kind of other examples, one really good example of kind of a king and a queen who shared power well was um, what they call in Spanish los reyes católicos. So you might be more familiar with them as Ferdinand and Isabella. So again, they were incredibly uh, effective as a power share, and they were both king and queen of their respective realm. Now, that meant that they had to work out, how is this going to work? What's my role in your kingdom? And what's your role in my kingdom? And who's going to do what? How is this going to work? So they were personally coming together, but they were also bringing their realms together. But they set up a series of kind of agreements, literally on paper, both before and after they were married and after she came to the throne, that really delineated who did what and who could who who had what kind of power and authority that worked really really well but in contrast that exact same thing was tried in the 12th century so we had the regnant queen of castile in this case was urafka and then she married the king of aragon who was 
Alfonso, the, the battler was his nickname, and they battled effectively. They were unable to to build a good partnership, both personally, apparently they really did not get along, and I think that's an understatement. And then politically, they couldn't manage that kind of union of their realms. They, they disagreed over powers. They ultimately end up going to war against one another, and their marriage obviously completely fell apart as well. So you know, it, it is all about getting that balance right, making sure that both partners are happy with how you're co-ruling. I know um, through my experience of teaching, an interesting partnership would be Mary the First and Philip the Second. You know, you mentioned Aragon and Castile a moment ago there. And you know, my students find it really difficult to get their heads around the fact that she's the queen legitimately in England, but she's married to a Spanish king. And how's that going to play out? You know, um, obviously they had no children. She passed away, but it's that Maybe it's an interesting story to see how one would have unfolded had circumstances been different. Absolutely. And I think it's important to remember with Mary and Philip that they were both descendants of the Reyes Catholicos of Ferdinand and Isabel. And so they had that example in front of them in terms of how it could work. But they had very particular kind of situation with their personal relationship and also again with their their partnership as well they weren't the rulers of two contiguous realms like Castile and Aragon who were next door to one another you know, Philip had this global empire that he inherited towards the end of their marriage and you know she was obviously needing to be in England and she was defining the role of a regnant queen she was our first crowned regnant queen of England and so there was a lot to work out in this country we'd not had a king consort before and there was a lot of concern about how are they going to share power is England going to be um, it demoted, if you like, in that partnership, because Spain at that time was the superpower of Europe. There was real concern that England might be swallowed up in that, particularly as Mary was a woman and understandings of how kind of marriages worked automatically put the husband on top. So a lot of reassurance had to be done. The act concerning regal power was drafted to kind of make it clear what Mary's role was as a sovereign and to, you know, kind of define and, and make sure that people were clear on the fact that even though she's a woman, her powers and prerogatives are the same. And and therefore, Philip would have a lesser prerogative as her spouse, as her husband, that Spain was not coming to rule England, that, that Philip was not coming to rule Mary, that she was still sovereign. And their marriage agreement and their even their wedding, the way that that was staged, was trying to emphasize that Mary was still the queen. And that was important. England was very uncertain how that was going to play out. That's right. I suppose we were third fiddle and there was fear of us being a satellite state with Philip's empire from famously from the Philippines to Peru. So it's the fear that England will be swallowed up. I mean, we all we all love a royal wedding, of course, but it seems from reading your book, there's more to a royal wedding story than meets the eye. You write about marriage very much as a political strategy, which varied across the globe, brother and sister marriages in African dynasties, in Japan, concubines bearing shogun children to prevent the mid-eye, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, having undue later influence. Even some interesting rituals, dare I say, to affirm the validity of a royal union. Can you tell us some more about these unusual situations? Yes, absolutely. So we're used to, again, royal marriages in a, in a Christian monogamous framework. And again, you know, millions of people around the globe kind of tuned in to watch William and Kate's wedding, for example. Um, but it, it doesn't always happen in the same way in different cultures and different contexts. So if we think about Africa, there were some definitely some different uh, rituals that were trying to ensure that the marriage was kind of blessed by you know, the divine, effectively. So one of the one of the examples of this in in what's now the South Sudan, if you like, the king and his bride were placed in a hut with an ebony fire, and this was a particular kind of smoky fire that was you know kind of a lot of people kind of reacted to. And, and basically they were watched and if they sneezed or they had a negative reaction to these fumes, it was an indication that basically their union was not blessed and you know, this wasn't going to work out basically. And that was it. It wasn't, the, you know, it did not pass go. But if they were able to withstand this horrible smoke, then it was a sign that the, the divine was happy. This was this was the right union. And then they kind of went ahead and confirmed the when the rest of the wedding would take place. So. Yeah, sometimes we do have these kind of testing rituals, if you like, almost like we think about Cinderella, like seeing if the shoe would fit. There is this kind of scenario to kind of ensure that, that this is the right person for the role and that the divine is happy with this. 
it almost sounds like a trial by ordeal, to be fair. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> Having said this, you've said then that matrimonial practices are the dividing line between monogamous and polygamous court environments. Can you explain a little bit further about that? Yeah. So it makes a huge difference to the experience of, of a royal woman, if you like, in terms of the monogamous or polygamous court framework. So we've talked already about kind of how that changes, kind of who is top dog. But it also changes, again, the situation of, of women in terms of their mobility. So we think a lot about um, kind of, you know, queens of royal women often um, coming in a Christian monogamous framework from the kind of high, normally they were princesses or from the high nobility. And again, they were, you know, kind of trained for the royal and, and brought in. But when you think about kind of polygamous court frameworks, there were lots of different selection processes. Some women came into the inner palace or the harem, et cetera, as slaves even, but were able to work their way up, particularly if they did bear a, a son who could become an heir. They could then become be promoted up the ranks or even in their son's reign, become the most powerful woman in the court. Some women were given as gifts to the king. So again, yeah, that was a completely different story. Like their family, again, wanted to ensure good relations or their dynasty between nations. So they could be kind of gifted. Some women were selected in a draft. So uh, again, in Asia, in, in Imperial China, for example, um, they had this draft and women of a particular age, about kind of 13, 14, were all kind of brought in and assessed, if you like, for their suitability. And they might be selected as a potential kind of consort for the son of the king or for the uh, so the emperor rather or the emperor himself or again they could be selected to be a palace servant or so they had these kind of processes so that is a real difference in terms of kind of preparation for the role if you were a princess who was being kind of groomed all your life for a particular match versus again coming in in any number of different ways and then having to kind of master this very challenging environment to sink or swim the complexities are so interesting. I think students would need a map of the world to try and understand what is happening where. That's something as a teacher that I've found the geographical and spatial understanding of differences across the globe. I think I would be equipping students with the timeline and a map as well to get to grips with the, with the differences. Is it, um, is it possible, do you think, to say if queens have more or less power now than in earlier times. You, you suggest the high point of queenly power being around the first millennia and a law of diminishing returns since then. I hope I have that right. But other studies suggest a more constant presence and female trajectory of authority. What was your views on that? Yeah. So, so there was a theory um, earlier on in the, in the in the kind of early stages of queenship studies, which was kind of in the kind of mid late twentieth century. There was kind of a going theory that, in terms of at least for Europe, that there was this kind of again in the early Middle Ages, queens had more power and authority, and then there was this kind of law of diminishing returns. Now, I don't agree with that, and there is um, there has been in recent years a lot of debate and discussion about the kind of trajectory of female power, and 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 certainly I think the, the conclusions of that has been that actually it changes the role of the queen as monarchy continues to change and adapt changes, but it's not necessarily meaning that women have less power. And I think that's something that's really important when we look at monarchy and queenship kind of across time and space, we see monarchy has been with us since our earliest you know, histories, if you like, and it's still with us today. And it's managed to survive because it does continually change and adapt. So there are some constants of kind of what is monarchy that kind of stays the same. But we've seen monarchy change and adapt over time. If you think of just in our country, et cetera, for example, here in the UK, you think about how it's changed from being kind of more of an absolute rule of the monarch in the Middle Ages, and even kind of thinking about the divine right of kings that you know J that James the sixth and first espoused, and obviously Charles the first ended up being a, <laughs> we had the regicide, if you like, some disagreement over that. But then, if you think about the Glorious Revolution, and and how that has a huge impact on the development of constitutional monarchy, and how even that form of monarchy has developed and changed so much from William and Mary to the present day. So, so mm -hmm. monarchy is constantly changing and evolving. And that doesn't mean that power is necessarily reducing. 
we've talked about the the queen and again you know she had in theory a lot of royal prerogatives but as we know she didn't necessarily exercise those in a way of kind of saying right you know i'm going to change the government or i'm going to put in a different prime minister but instead she exercised a very potent form of soft power that she used her role even in the constraints that she had in it in order to be an incredibly effective diplomat in order to to have a great deal of influence within that role. So we see how the role has changed and power has changed and the way that the role is exercised changes over time. But again, it's not it's not so simple as kind of just more power, less power. It's more in how it changes. Yeah. You mentioned the adaptations and the changes. And of course, through time, the image of the monarch is absolutely vital that they're held up. You know, they were these... Um, you know, monarchical sort of mirrors of how to be a whole literary genre of how to be, how to be worthy, how to be pious, you know, you're supposed to be pretty and, you know, politically um, able to tread the line and all of this. Um, and I suppose a, a way in for teachers would be through the use of objects like coins and stamps and portraits, of course, for imagery and tombs and furniture and letters and reliquaries and books and all those kinds of little micro approaches. That may well be a good way into queenship studies in a classroom setting. And I think with your students, this is something that you use as well. Would you agree that that's a good way in the micro towards the macro. Absolutely. So if you think about kind of that history of the world and a hundred objects, um, again, the, the museum. Great book. Yeah, it's absolutely fabulous. And, and again, that is a really, really helpful way of kind of engaging with queenship. So again, one of the things that I do with my students is we look at coins, for example, we look at seals, we look at all of these kind of visual depictions, we look at portraits and, and we kind of unpick the symbolism and the ideas and and what's being communicated through those objects and it is a really powerful way of 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 understanding queenship particularly things like seals and coins which were a, a huge part of kind of projecting majesty and authority and power through kind of all of the the names of all of the different titles and if you think about philip and mary that we were talking about and they had this huge kind of smattering of titles from all their kind of joint titles you know england ireland wales you know um, the spain and sicily etc etc so yeah you know, again think about how they project their titles how they show that power sharing so again sitting side by side with the crown the insignia, the heraldry, the orb, the scepter, all of the different ways in which their power and authority, majesty, and their co-ruling partnership is shown as well. Um, so that is really, really powerful. And again, thinking about that, going back to the example that we used earlier of the Reis Catolicos, one thing they did with their seal is traditionally the king's seal, the sovereign seal would have the, the monarch enthroned as like kind of giving justice on the front. And then on the back in the Middle Ages, you'd often have the, the king is kind of a knight on horseback, kind of charging as like the defender of the realm. And so what the Reyes Catolicos did was they had Isabel enthroned on the front, so as the kind of monarch giving justice. And on the back, you've got Ferdinand kind of in that kind of knightly chivalric mode, right? So Philip and Mary, they sit together on the front. So they each are enthroned side by side with the kind of, you know, with the elements of power kind of shared between them. And on the back, they're both on horseback. So it's really interesting that they're sharing both things and you can kind of see that evolving idea of kind of this co-ruling partnership, how they're projecting their partnership, this idea of shared authority, which they're visually communicating. So objects can be a really great way of kind of unpicking all that and thinking about how monarchs wanted to project themselves and also the objects that they collected, what was important to them and how they're also kind of crafting an image through their their collections, Catherine the Great and the Hermitage being kind of the one of the most famous kind of art collections of all time. Of course, of course. And for students, of course, treasured possessions, it would be probably trainers and mobile phones today, but fascinating to see things like, you know, coins and stamps standing the test of time. But having said this, I mean, as you acknowledge in your introduction, perhaps 
your expansive study is flying in the face of societal and cultural trends. And certainly in schools, there has been a move away from rulers and rule makers towards studying those who are ruled. The Historical Association's 2021 survey revealed that 83% of respondents were making changes to their curriculums to try and make them more diverse. So I suppose the question is, how do you respond to that with curriculums being so crowded? Is there a case for retaining queens and queenships or perhaps introducing more diversity through a non-European non-Christian, more global lens, as you previously mentioned. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways in which you can approach queens and queenship and still be kind of speaking to what we're trying to do to really kind of diversify who we're looking at. One of the things I find really exciting about teaching um, royal studies, queenship studies and court studies is if you look at the royal court, you've actually got like a microcosm of society. So the royal court encapsulates everyone from the king and the queen or the emperor, the empress, etc., on the top all the way down to often slaves at the bottom or again even in our you know european framework again you've got long dresses and stable boys the lowest of the low to the highest of the high so just within that framework you've got the opportunity to look at society as a whole and it's really exciting because the core is also kind of the political and the cultural center of the realm. They're cosmopolitan melting pots where you've got ambassadors and visitors and, again, royal brides coming from abroad and bringing foreign kind of, you know, um, uh, household mem- members with them. So, again, you've got a way to study so many different dynamics in terms of political, cultural, religious change, etc., all from the center of the court. You've also got the opportunity to look at things like, again, a a really exciting area at the moment has been sexuality studies, bringing that in, trying to understand um, gender and sexuality through the experience of courtiers and royals and their relationships, etc. And that's been a really interesting and exciting area. But I think it's also important because it allows us to look at women. I think one of the things that's really important is that we've been talking a lot about how all too often women are either not really featured in the curriculum or they're introduced in a very kind of token way or as in kind of an exceptionalist way. And often people have thought about queens in that way. So they've held up a few token examples, oh, Elizabeth I, Eleanor of Aquitaine, et cetera. But these were exceptions and really women weren't that engaged. And that's one of the big areas that's been kind of breaking through in scholarship right now. There's been these series of conferences called Beyond Exceptionalism, which has been trying to kind of explain that actually the political agency of women was a norm. It's it's not just these odd women like Isabella of France and you know it, 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 Elizabeth I, Catherine the Great, et cetera, that, that, that wielded power, that actually these women were particularly interesting examples that have received a lot of, you know, um, uh, uh, focus. But if you look across times, there are so many rural women who were incredibly active, who were incredibly significant in supporting religious change, in supporting cultural development, who were politically influential, who were ruling in frameworks that we would look at and at face value think about being disempowering to women, and yet women were still very powerful working within them. So I think bringing women back into the entirety of the picture and looking at them because they are half of monarchy, they're half of the human race, rather than just looking at little examples helps us to understand that. So I think, again, that's why I'm so evangelistic about thinking about women, rural women in the global context, because while I love Eleanor of Aquitaine, I love Cleopatra, I love Elizabeth I, there are so many women who have really exciting stories to tell. So we need to kind of expand the focus and move beyond just selected examples. Well, your evangelism is infectious, Ellie. It really is. And I think the idea of going beyond exceptionalism, I read how queens have had power in every continent and in every era of history. So I think we should end on such an optimistic note about the power of women beyond the setting of monarchy. The fact that your book speaks about empowering maybe wider career and life messages for young women and young people. Preparation for taking charge, codes of conduct, co-ruling, shadowing, the role of mentors, networking. I think there's almost a career message for young people within your writings. I don't know how you feel about that, but that was something that I 
took away and think that is an angle I would take with some young people. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, I've been kind of ruminating about this recently. And I think, I think for, for young people, I hope there's kind of three big takeaways, if you like, from looking at kind of queens of queenship. And one of them is, first of all, that it's not a fairy tale thing. We tend to think about queens and princesses in a kind of Disney-fied way, you know, and we think of it as being a real fairy tale. And it's not. Actually, being a queen or a princess is hard. It's a challenging position. It is a real job. It's like being a CEO. You're managing your lands, your household. You might be running the whole inner palace. You might even be running the whole realm, right? So it, it is, it's a tough job. It's a tough job. So that's the first takeaway. The second one is that networking is the key to success. And I think if we look at you know, the experience of royal women, the ones who are successful are the ones who can network. And one of my colleagues talks at the difference between being a spider or an island. So islands are not successful. It's the spiders. You have to weave webs. You have to bring people in. You have to leverage your natal network, your familial network. You need to build new networks at court. You need to connect it with people at other courts abroad to be successful and influential. So that is just as true today. Networking is the key to success. And it finally, I hope they, they will see that women can do anything. And that, again, women have been at the heart of power. They have been key movers and shakers across all time and space. And we are so fortunate to live in an era where there is much more recognition of the need for complete equality between men and women. But I'm hoping that looking backwards, they can appreciate that actually women have always been involved. They've always been engaged. They've always been agents of political, cultural, and religious change. The queens were not decorative. They were co-rulers. They were involved in shaping the world, and they still are today. A fabulously powerful message for young people. Ellie Woodacre, long may you reign. I've thoroughly enjoyed speaking to you this morning. Thank you so, so much for your contributions to the Reteach podcast. Thanks again, Carmel. Mm-hmm.